But before talking about types, what we want to know the meaning of judgment? What the what the word? The word judgment. What the meaning of the word judgment? Judgment simply means the final determination of a dispute. The final determination of a dispute which spells out the rights and liabilities of the parties based on the facts submitted to the court in the final determination. I am careful to have used two or three words that I'm going to explain. Final determination of the court with respect to a dispute submitted to the court. And this determination spells out the rights and liabilities of the parties depending on what has been submitted to the court. Now, when we talk about final determination, it simply means that in a proceeding, there could be series of determinations. Are you following me? There could be series of determinations until the final determination. In other words, there may be an instance where a determination will bring the proceeding to an abrupt end except it is reactivated. I want to let the background why I did not agree with them that it's something called interlocutory judgment. So that's where I'm coming. Now, when a court is hearing a matter and an issue is raised, which issue is not the determining factor or the determinant factor of the entire dispute? Once that issue is resolved, the court will do what? We still move on. In other words, determinations include rulings, orders, and decrees made by the court. But these orders, rulings, and, um, and decrees are different from the final determination of the court, which terminates the proceedings. The final determination of the court terminates the entire proceedings. Generally, there is the ecclesiastical judgment as well as jurisprudential judgment. So when we talk about ecclesiastical judgment, which more or less are no longer separated by virtue of the Judicature Act. Somebody still remember the Judicature Act? Yes, yes, sir. But when they were still flowing differently, common law, equity, they were distinguishable one from another. But by the amalgamation, it becomes what? Usually flowing into a single stream. So an example of a ecclesiastical judgment is just like when God asks Adam, 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 where are you? What have you done? Blah, blah, blah. And Adam raised a defense. We're still going to look at this in second semester. Adam raised a defense. But despite the defense of Adam, there was what a final, there was what a determination. There was a determination. The same thing happened between Ken and Nebel. Ken slew Abel, and when he was confronted by God, he tried to make excuses to raise a defense which didn't avail him. And then there was what? Final determination. So similarly, the same when you look at the case of Adam, you discover that what ought to be the judgment was not actually the judgment. Why? Because Adam was pre-warned. On the day you thought he this would you shall do what? Did he die? He did not die. So which means what God simply passed on him was what ruling. There was no final determination because he kept living from that moment thereafter. He didn't die. So I'm trying to give you an illustration that in the proceeding, there could be series of rulings, orders made by the court. Maybe I tender a document, my friend raises objection, 
and his objection is sustained, I will withdraw the document. Either I withdraw, or the court will do what? Will rule on it, rejecting it, and marking my document as what? Rejected. That's the ruling. Has he brought the matter to an end? No. no. It has not. Maybe while we are still doing our matter, my lady friend runs to the court. My lord, my opponent has put bulldozer in my land. He's doing this, he's, doing, he's changing the face of the land. Maybe my lord may visit the locals. This is the locals' info. After observation, my lord gives a restraining order. Does that restraining order bring the matter to end? No, sir. So that is why we say that the one that qualifies as judgment is the one that does what? Determines the entire thing. After we, the hands of the judge will be what? Five. So that is how to approach judgment. So we have been able to distinguish judgment from others and other ancillary ruling. See the case of uh, Adekunle against INEC. Adekunle against INEC, where the court took time to draw this distinction. 2024, 8 Nigerian Open Law Report. Adekunle against INEC, 2024, 8 NWLR. Part 1941, page 513, page 513. Now, having looked into the background of what we are studying, the next thing is to look at types, types of judgment. And suffice it to say that types of judgments are different from what forms of judgment. Types may qualify as categories, but they are different from the forms of the judgment. And one we want to ask, what is the difference between the two? When you talk about types of judgment, you're talking about the classification. You know, just like, um, let's say, when you come into this faculty, you have types of students, am I right? Yes. You have a hundred level, two hundred, those are types, those are categories, okay? But now you have types of judgment we're going to talk about and when we have form form simply means the nature of the judgment so this nature of judgment or form of judgment can still find its way into what into the types or categories it simply means the modus operandi of each judgment of the judgment the way they behave so when we talk about the form of student how do students behave do, do, do all of you behave alike no there are people who gossip, right? There are people who are friendly. There are people who just need you and they don't care about you. And there are those who don't care coming to classes. These are forms of students. Now, when we talk about types of judgment, we have default judgment. Judgment in limine, they are very close, closely related. But then they have the same thing. Judgment in limine is a Latin word in L-I-M-I-N-E, limine. You have consent judgment as the third one, and you have judgment on the merit. Judgment on the merit. I'm still going to discuss the one after the other. And talk about forms. This judgment, how do they behave? We have declaratory judgment. So, which means default judgment may be declaratory in nature. Judgment in limine may be declaratory. Consent judgment may also be declaratory. Same thing happens to final judgment. The, the behavior is there, how it operates. And then also have executory judgment as a form of judgment, executory. After discussing types, I also come to discuss them. And each of these judgments may share in this nature of form. Now we'll go back to types of judgment, default judgment. Just like the name implies, it means judgment that has been delivered in the absence or without the participation of the opposite or opposing party. Judgment given in the absence or without the participation of the opposing party. That is a default judgment. This may happen during pre-trial, we studied pre-trial. If during pre-trial, one of the parties, let's say the claimant, is willing to participate, he comes to the court, 
the other party, the defendant, refuses to participate. Judgment will be done what? Will be given to him. But if it is only, only the defendant that has appeared and the claimant has refused to appear, after reasonable time, now if after that period the claimant is unwilling, what will happen? The suit will be dismissed, which means judgment will be given to the defendant by virtue of what? The matter being dismissed. And that is called what? Default judgment. Now, another type of default judgment is non appearance, not just in the main trial. Let's take, for instance, we have done pre trial, everybody participated, and now the matter is to be heard on the merit. The claimant comes and the defendant has not come. We have talked about what should happen. On that very day, the court may either do what? Adjourn the matter and issue order for hearing notice to be issued to the defendant. Or when the court is satisfied that the defendant has been sufficient in good of notice, the court will do what? Ask the claimant to go ahead with his case. If by the time he finishes his case, the defendant still fails to appear, what will happen? Judgment will be entered for the claimant. And that judgment is called what? The Similarly to, if the defendant is the one coming, and the claimant hasn't bothered to come, the court will be entitled to hold that the claimant has done what? Abandoned his suit. And then what will happen? The suit will be thrown out. Now, when a judgment is dismissed, by virtue of non-appearance of the other party. That is missile is equal to what? <coughs> striking out. So that's when maybe some textbooks will tell you that is uh, interlocutory judgment, there is nothing like that. There is nothing like that. Why? Because the other party might be absent due to one reason or the other. It could be that he didn't even remember that that matter would be coming down there, am I right? Good. When such a judgment has been given against him, has he finally determined his fate? What will he do? He can bring an application for the judgment to be done what? Set aside. And time extended for him to do what? To defend the suit. Right. So we have handled default judgment now. Another judgment which is which looks closer, <coughs> like the default judgment, is the judgment in limine. So what it means, the word in limine means to finally dispose of something <coughs> at the initial stage. To finally dispose of the proceedings at the initial stage. This is also what some textbooks call what interlocutory judgment. But I will tell you why it does not qualify, why it cannot be called interlocutory judgment. Now, the kind of things that may terminate a proceeding in limine <coughs> may be in form of what? A preliminary objection. Let's say, for instance, A has brought an action against B. They have filed their pleadings, exchange and pleadings are closed, and now A raises an issue for the court to determine whether B has a local standard, assuming it's B that C, or whether there is a condition precedent that ought to be fulfilled which has not been fulfilled. Now, or whether the case is what statute bad. Let's take them one after the other. Let's say, for instance, the action is statute bad. What will the court do? The court will strike it out. Once that matter is struck out, he does what? He brings the matter to final end. <clears throat> you can, it cannot be listed, and it cannot be done what? Really litigated. So it has died, it has ended. It has become stale. So looking at this, you cannot call it what? Interlocutory simply means after this stage, there is still what another stage. So that's why you can't call such judgment 
interlocutory judgment. Now again, let's say for instance, reaction notice was not filed and served before the action was brought. And now that suit suffers what? A striking out. It does what? It brings that suit to what? To an end. But has he determined the right of the person who made the mistake? He can do what? He can recommence. He can start afresh. But as far as that very suit is concerned, that suit is what? It's gone. So you will now have to do another one, wait for 30 days after the expiration, he now begins the new process. Right. At that very stage, can you call that judgment interlocutory judgment? No. Why? Why can't you call it interlocutory judgment? Because it wasn't in the original position. That very suit. Assuming the suit number is 13, maybe HU 13, 2024. Once he struck out on that ground, he dies. And when you are coming back again, other people have filed several suits. Maybe when you are filing them, maybe number 100. You understand? So it cannot be said to be part of the one that has been done or struck out. So that's why we disagree with those who call it interlocutory judgment. Same thing applies in other condition precedent which you have failed to comply with. It simply means the court will not have what? Jurisdiction. And what they call like judicial, it can neither dot and I nor say T. So that will end it. So we have to come back. So decisions given in this kind of situation is considered to be a judgment unless the action is what reactivated in another form. And when it's coming back, apart from statute of limitation matters. And when it is coming back, it is not coming back in the former suit. It's coming back as an independent suit. All right. OK? And then we have consent judgment. Consent. That they rightly pointed out, consent is the judgment given based on the terms agreed by the contesting parties. Judgment given based on the terms agreed upon by the contesting parties which the court adopts as his judgment. Which the court adopts as his judgment. Whereas the other types of judgments are appealable, a consent judgment as a general rule is not appealable. A consent judgment as a general rule is not what? Appealable. And we know that in some general rule there may be what? Some exceptions. The exceptions here is if the party can show, the party challenging the judgment can show that the consent was obtained by fraud, misrepresentation, or fundamental mistake. If any party can show that, then the appellate court may look at it to find out what was the fraud played on this person. How was the consent got? Was he deceived? Was he based on misrepresentation or a fundamental or even unilateral mistake that went to the root of the decision? In that case, an appeal may be allowed. And then finally, we have judgment on the merit. Judgment on the merit. This is a kind of judgment that is given after all the parties and their witnesses have been heard, and counsel address the court. And counsel, you can see our counsel finally address the court. All the parties must be heard, and parties finally address the court. So immediately after that the court gives judgment, you call that what? Final judgment or judgment on the merit. Now let's look at forms of judgment before we talk about the writing style. Forms of judgment, we have um, compressed them into two categories, two forms. The first one is declaratory, declaratory judgment. Declaratory judgment 
are those judgments where the courts make declarations in accordance with the relief sought. The courts make declarations in accordance with the relief sought. These judgments are said not to be executory. These judgments are said not to be executory because it does not command the doing of an act. It does not command the doing of an act. I'll give you an example. Somebody has gone to court. You know, maybe his first relief is a declaration that the claimant is the person entitled to apply for a grant of statutory right of occupancy over the piece of land called Opolo Azolo, whatever, lying and situated at Isia Langwa, wherever it is. So that relief is seeking the court to do what? To make that declaration that it is this person that is entitled to. That order has not asked him to do what? To apply. Are you following me? But what it has said is that A is entitled to apply. So if you like, go out and apply. So that's why it is what declaration. But in the same suit, there may also be a relief. Will be order of the court, or let me also, okay, order of the court damnifying the defendant in damages for trespass for the sum of 200,000 naira. And the court may say, on that very order, the court hereby finds the court is not talking, not declaring what you have asked him to declare. The court hereby finds that the defendant actually trespassed into the land of the claimant. Right? And the court orders the, the defendant to pay the sum of 100,000 naira for trespassing into the land of the claimant. It's directive, isn't it? It's asking the defendant to do, to do a specific thing. But the first relief is not asking for that. It just simply made a declaration. So you can see the difference between the two. One simply makes a declaration simpliciter, which entitles you to further rights. But the other one is what? Makes an order with finality. <coughs> so the second one is what is called executory judgment. So a particular judgment may contain both executory relief and declaratory relief. So but what you do is that when you want to execute a judgment, you can only execute what? The letter one. You can only execute the B and not relief A because there's nothing to execute. All right. It's just like you asking the court to declare that you are the owner of this car. And look at my particular say, okay, I've looked at the document and uh, from evidence before me, I believe that the car belongs to Mr. A. Do you understand? What he has it done is has simply declared, based on what he's looking at, that the car does what belongs to you. So are you going to execute it? And what will you execute? It's already what? In your possession. So we now move over to writing of judgment. Writing of judgment. There are some basic formalities for writing judgments. There are some basic formalities for writing judgments. But there is no particular style. But there is no particular style for writing judgment. The law has set, up, set down some formalities that must be observed when a judge is writing judgment. You follow it. Nothing like style. The judge, the law, telling you this is the style you must apply. No. For instance, when you read law reports. You, will be, you begin to fall in love with some judges, depending on who you are, what you feel. Like me, I'm a poet, and I like poet, right? So when I read judgment from Kayodesho, Okuta J.A.C., Acholono, C.C. Mweze, I mean, um, he brings out the vibes. You understand? Because these are people who write in, in, in flowing poetry. Their judgments are very, very sweet. But there are judgments you read, it will just like you're hitting rock. <laughs> you know, no life, no life in it. You understand? 
But when you read a document that sets up why your imagination may be telling you that judgment is a double way traffic and you begin to envision it. You understand? That one runs this way, one runs this way, but not one is for one particular person. Because that this judgment is both for the accused and the prosecutor or the victim or the distant the victim. Right. So, and the, maybe when a judge is analyzing a situation that is current, uh, some judges will just say, uh, from my evidence, A stabbed B, and I therefore committed murder. But there's somebody who will tell you that A has committed murder in a hopeful scar. And the way you've been seeing it, as you're reading it, you're hating the murderer. As you're reading it, that he did it, he's heartless, he's a beast, he has the speciality in him, made him to do this, and it was like he has taken you to the pre-Elizabethan period when it was survival of the fetus. And you're beginning to, is it not this if this man wrote it too like that this man is writing as mainly here? And you don't even care because you're enjoying it. So that's talking about what style. Everybody can adopt his own style. But first and foremost, some of those formalities, including the time frame for writing judgment. The time frame for writing judgment is 90 days. 90 days. By section 294, subsection 1 of the Constitution, 294, sub 1 of the Constitution, I'll just read it so that you follow. It says, every court established under the Constitution, every court, every court of record. So it's not like he's talking about the Supreme Court now, no. He's talking about what every court that is established under the Constitution, which are called courts of record, shall deliver his decision in writing not later than 90 days after the conclusion of the evidence and final address and furnish all parties to the court or matter determined with duly authenticated copies of the decision within seven days of delivery of the judgment. Now, this provision has always been there. But I'm going to tell you what has changed in the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended. Right. Under this law, the issue has always been, what is the effect where a judge has failed to give the judgment within what, 90 days? And the rule was that a party challenging the judgment based on that factor was do what? Is probably that he suffered what? Miscarriage of justice. That he can't suffer miscarriage of justice. Justice. And there is no hard and fast rule about what constitutes miscarriage of justice. It depends on what one has gone through, what one has suffered. But we still have to know that the judges are human beings, right? Mm. And they have duties to discharge. The law, granters of this new law, and be said in the, the fact that these people are human beings. So to reject them into 90 days may not be fair to them, all right? It may not necessarily be fair to them. And because of that, we have section 294, subsection 5 of the Constitution. Section 294, subsection 5 of the Constitution, which says, the decision of a court shall not be set aside or treated as a nullity solely on the ground of non-compliance with the provisions of subsection 1. That is subsection I talked about. Or this is unless the court is exercising jurisdiction by way of appeal or review of that decision, is satisfied that the party complaining has suffered a miscarriage of justice. Now you see how this place has counted, how the new law has counted. The new law has now placed it within what? The discretion of the appellate court. The appellate court has to be satisfied that actually you have suffered a miscarriage of justice before the court will now agree with you that that delay affected the judgment. About the number of days now, time limit, other mandatory requirements is that the judgment 
must be able to appraise the facts of the case. The judgment must appraise the facts of the case. So you don't just start writing judgment. From the evidence before me, I agree with the claimant, and I have a hold that the claimant is entitled to blah, blah, blah. No. You have to tell us what are the facts, what happened. So the court must first of all state the facts of the case. And then evaluate the evidence placed before him. State the facts of the case, evaluate the evidence placed before the court. This evidence include what? Both oral and what? Documentary evidence. Both oral and documentary evidence. So the court will have to analyze it after stating the facts. The court will say, the claimant called Mr. A, who was the CW1. The evidence of Mr. A was blah, 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 blah. The claimant also called Mr. C, who testified as CW2. The evidence of Mr. CW2 is that he is a boundary neighbor to the land in this. And then, just like that, after that, you now look at the case of the defendants. Tell us who, how many witnesses did he call, what did they say, and then after that, the court will now begin to analyze the evidence. A contradicted B, these are witnesses of the defendants. Or they agree on a single issue. So whatever my law discovers is what is called what? Evaluation of evidence. It has to be there. Then after that, my law will now discuss the fallout of the final address. The fallout of the final address. Because you know, the claimant would have um, addressed the court. Defendants also would have addressed the court. They would have all filed their final written addresses. So my Lord will begin to talk about the fallout. Maybe this person filed, this person didn't file. This person filed, both of them filed. A ought me to do so, so, so. B ought me not to take into cognition the submission of A. Just like that, that is what, what is called analyzing the format of the addressing. And then again, there is the resolution of issues for determination. Resolution of the issues for determination. The Lord will now be able to tell us from the case of A and the case of B, the issue for determination is this, or are these. And the Lord will now begin to discuss the issues for determination. It may be that even the claimant formulated an issue which is not convincing to my Lord. My Lord can do what? That is the issue he formulated. My Lord has a right to do what? Formulate an issue so mutual and ask the people, the parties to address him on that. On that. You know, but if the issues are already engraved in what they submitted as submission, there won't be any need to call them again to come and address on that very issue. Now, after setting out the, the issues and resolving them, my Lord will now give reason, will give decision and reasons for his decision. Every judgment must have reasons. Any judgment that does not have reason is a nullity. My Lord will now give decision. If you are now believing or you, want your, you feel that um, A has succeeded in proving his entitlement to the subject matter, what are your reasons? My reasons is that he tendered a documentary evidence which was not challenged. That is reason. My reason is that Mr. Soto so corroborated his evidence. That is reason. So the reasons must be done what must be there. And conclusion logically drawn. Conclusion must be logically drawn. See the case of side pain, side pain, contracting <coughs> company Nigeria Limited. Saipem, S-A-I-P-E-M, Contracting Company Nigeria Limited against OTA, UGA. 2024, 8th Nigerian Weekly Law Report, 
at 1941, page 557. Page 557. 